Okay guys, I'm going to spend 15 minutes to help you get a start on your animation of the Flarsec project. And you can see right away I'm using the underhand grip, the gestural hand, for the pencil to help me scoot around this page. Now I'm looking at one of the principles of animation here, of appeal, and making sure this little fellow's jolly and plump. And one of the major problems I'm seeing with students is they're drawn a magic carpet that's flat, possibly based on that Aladdin magic carpet, which had the principles of the Flarsec, with the corners, with the hands, and the feet. Okay, now you can see how I've used many lines there to find the one I want, and that's called Pentimento. So I don't erase, I just rub back with my finger or a piece of tissue. And that's the magic of using a pencil on paper. It's still the best way to get these ideas done. Now you can see that long line of action that I'm indicating there. There's many lines of action, by the way. There's not just the one. But we go for the biggest one first, the longest line that's in the drawing. And we're getting the twist here, and I'm avoiding double bunches. So if you find in the human figure, which is what this is based on, this is a torso and a pelvis, and the middle part is the obliques and the abdominals. That's the idea of it, to personify this little flower sack into us believing, suspending our disbelief that it's actually alive, the illusion of life. That's our whole project, is to make this little flower sack believable as a living thing. Now overlaps are going to tell us that that foot's in front, and even though I've drawn through, which means the line is still visible when I did the big arc, we can come back and fade those lines afterwards. So it's important to show what foot's in front and what foot's behind, because what we have to do also, these are key frames, these are the action poses. That first one actually is a breakdown pose, when the little guy's in action, he's not actually in any kind of action at all. He's inert to some degree, but even in those drawings I'll give him some life, some bend and squash. Another principle of animation, a very vital one. Okay, I'm pushing this little guy up in the air here, and I'm very conscious of the fact that even though I'm using the squash and stretch principle, that I don't overdo it with the flower sack. We can overdo it with a figure, but with a flower sack we don't want him to end up looking like something else. At the minute he's very close to looking like a potato. So we've got to keep it in mind that this is a three-quarter filled flour sack, or a sugar sack. It doesn't matter what the granules inside are. I've seen people fuss on that. Sometimes called the sugar bag. It could even be a salt bag. It doesn't matter. The idea we're thinking about is that it's a soft bag filled with something heavy, three-quarters. Not hammers, obviously. You'd see lumps. So it's a smoothish thing to represent the torso of the human body. And there's an overlap. Overlaps are so important because they give us a sense of dimension on a two-dimensional surface. And so if we don't have an overlap, our drawings look flat. I'll use a tissue sometimes, or even a chamois leather that's been washed and dried, to fade the drawing back. Remember, all of those lines that we still see are thoughts. And if we don't leave our thoughts behind, we'll fall into the trap of erasing every line we don't like and forget what lines we actually did like to begin with. Remember, your third or fourth line may not be an improvement. We hope it will be, but the first line might have been the best line, and if you've erased it, then we no longer have the history of it. Like on that first little flower sack, you can still see all the lines, and the outer faded line is actually the best one. Another good idea is to draw many of these little things, scoot ahead, one after the other, to keep that gesture going, and then you can come back to the first one again and look at it with a fresh eye and say, you know, that faded line is actually the best line. And do what I'm doing here now, which is to darken your favorite line. So you get a choice of one, two, three, maybe four. Okay, so I'm feeling now the pinch and stretch idea, just like in the human body. If we bend forward, we pinch on the bend. And obviously... If we're bending at our stomach, our back is getting stretched and arched in a long line. So I've made a little note. It's too busy. And that's one of the principles of animation I'm thinking about, is clarity. 
we want to think about how clear that can be. So I'm going to put in here a little action pose of the little guy going forward. Now think about in real life in the life draw when the weight burned foot is flat on the ground or close to it. Then the nose is trying to hover in between your feet or over that foot. And if we can't get over that foot because we're off balance, then we try to rebalance. That's why this is an action pose. Because it's not balanced. An action pose is off balance. And so he's trying to rebalance. That's what we're constantly doing. And that's when we get animation or the sense of it, of an off balance pose. The little guy at the very start, our breakdown pose, passing pose sometimes known as, where we see a transition that's quite simple and inactive in some way, is the in between the action poses. That's the breakdown pose. So we have here now a little guy that is going to sing some opera for us. And so we have to maybe put a little hard edge here and there. The clarity and the appeal are two things we struggle with because we're talking about basically structure and gesture there. And if we get too structural, meaning hard edges and square edges, we lose a little bit of appeal. But we gain solidity, and so we need both. And we need to balance those so we get a beautiful character that's not too floppy and not too stiff. And that's what I'm working with here. So if we flare the bottom of the flower sack more than the top, generally, then we'll get that feeling of solidity because most of the flour or sugar is holding the character to the floor. Now, if we want an off balance or slightly off balance pose here, then we change that dynamic. And here I've got a sleuth, a little guy that's a detective, leaning way forward and sniffing for clues. Looking at this drawing here now, I'm trying to redistribute some of the flour and some of the sugar or whatever you've got in your sack and push it near the top. Same with the opera singer. He's making himself a little chest that's bigger, puffed out. And you can see that I've indicated the force of him going forward there. So make lots of notes in your drawings. These are your key drawings, remember. This is your drawings about animation, and we need the anticipation of the action, the action itself, and the reaction to the action to get any kind of believability that this thing is alive, this little flower sack is alive. And you can see it even just in these drawings, that it's coming alive by the gesture. The gesture shows us the humanity of the little guy. These little asymmetrical feet are going to help us as well. So if the feet are always the same, distance apart, the same size, we lose the dynamic of life. So look at every single drawing there, and you'll see slightly different changes to each of those feet. Unless they are inert, like the jumping pose, where the feet just dangle helplessly. Generally, what we want is one ear up a little bit more than the other, like we've got in the opera singer there. At first glance, maybe they look parallel, but they're just off a little bit, and that helps us. Look at the throwing pose, the second pose along from the top, and see that that little ear is stretched just a touch and different from the other one, which is more rounded because it's not so stretched. And on that note, be very wary of pointed ears. The ears can point if you want them to suddenly become devilish. It's a cartoon after all, we can do anything we want. But for the most part, we want those little ears to be roundish to keep that appeal. And we got another opera singer here and he's throwing his arms way out, way up, with much more gesture. So we're getting into an extreme pose now. So you work out your key poses, and in between those key poses, and remember the key poses are the storytelling poses, the action poses. When one action changes to another action. When you bend forward, you've changed the action from standing upright. And then the extreme poses, like the little guy going forward there in the force pose, then you've got the extreme, the extreme in between where things are stretched to their limit. A boxer has been punched and his head's flown all the way back and stretched his neck out. It's an extreme pose. So we work in order. Get the action poses in first, the key poses, where an action changes, the story changes, 
and then you get your extreme poses in between where that story got extreme, where that flower set gets stretched to its limit. And in between all of that, we put the breakdown pose, the passing through pose, where a character is basically in its original shape, unstretched, and then put the in-betweens in between. It's actually very simple at the end of the day, as long as we treat it that way. And you can, in your animation, put little barking noises like I've done there. And remember, these poses can be anything, depending on the next in-between pose. We could take any one of those two opera singers and say, well, one's a detective. And the in-between poses, where the character moves, is going to indicate whether it's an opera singer or a detective. Uh, you'll see it in the story. So at the minute, we don't have the animation to tell us what these stories are. But what we have is the vitality of it, the vital moments of change in action. Got the anticipation, like we have in the line of action posed on there, of a person about to walk, they're off balance, and then they're going to find their balance as they walk, and they can walk fast or slow. We don't know yet, we haven't animated it. And when we do, that's when it comes alive. Because at the moment, what we're doing here is working out the pose-to-pose -pose ideas. We're working out the story. The key poses that we might use or discard. And then when we've got everything in order, then we can start working with a straight ahead idea, which is to work between these poses and make little secondary actions. Maybe the ears fly back as he runs forward. Maybe when he stops, the ears flop forward and one just perked back up. We don't know yet. That's for the straight ahead. At the moment, we're doing our due diligence and working the staging out. This is the staging idea. Okay, and there we got a tiptoe idea of a ballet dancer, perhaps. Or just someone that's very dainty. And it's a nice thought to have someone that's quite rotund or plump being dainty. It goes against our expectations and makes us happy to see the life in that and the surprise in it. So study your friends, study people in real life, and you'll get all the characters in the world you need to get these little flower sex animated. Now every once in a while I see students and they add limbs to their character. Remember these little ears can only stretch so far. Once they look like an arm or a leg, you've missed the point of this project. No props either. We can't have anyone if they're sword fencing holding a sword. We have to indicate that through the animation. That's the idea of this. That's the challenge and the discipline of this. So I've seen legs and thighs appear. If you feel you're starting to get a leg or a thigh, do what I've done there. Bring a sweeping curve across from one leg to the other. And think of maybe Alibaba pants, perhaps, if you're starting to get into that stretch. But try and keep that balance of the three-quarter filled flower sack throughout, whether it goes up to your chest or down to the bottom. And when you start getting into that magic carpet look, be very wary, like I've got in this drawing here very close to a magic carpet. I need to plump some of that out. That's why there's many lines and I would fade that back with tissue and have another go. So these are just rough and ready drawings for you to copy, draw along with and copy again until you get your own hand, your own gestural hand in yourself. By copying these little drawings over and over by osmosis you'll have now absorb some of what I have put in plain view here for you guys to work with and springboard off with your own drawings. Okay guys, so I'll get your action poses in, your key poses, your key drawings, and then work out your scene. What is it going to be? A sword fencer, a boxer, anything with action. The character has to at least walk a few steps or run, turn, jump, but Mostly it has to have those principles of animation, squash and stretch, anticipation, staging, straight ahead action and pose to pose, follow through and overlapping action with a little ears move after the fact for instance, arcs, smooth motions, a secondary action, once again the reaction to a bigger part moving a smaller part. And the timing, make sure your timing is perfect so it shouldn't look jerky. Exaggerate when you can, but not too much. And the drawings have to be solid. That's what we're working on here. 
Yeah, we have to believe this. Little flour sack has weight and it has life. So it's the solid drawing and the appeal all in one. All right, guys. So watch those pointy ears. All right, I look forward to your own efforts on this. Good luck with your work, guys.